started with a beef seminar. Uh, there's plenty of room at the front. Y'all are welcome to sit down, enjoy. We're going to give four different presentations, and then we're going to open the floor to any questions you all have. I want to start a pitch first. I've been over at the beef, uh, Long Orleans Beef Committee chair uh, quite, a, quite a bit this weekend, explaining to people what the uh, beef providers list really is. Uh, we've ha now had a marketing budget given to us by the board of $10,000. And we found that that would buy probably two ads once a year in good publications. <laughs> so we knew immediately our, our marketing direction had to be internet. We got the ad together. We got a gentleman that I hope we can hear from later, he's in a different meeting right now, that is working with us. And we have gone from um, unknown to being among the top ten on our website and we're reaching thousands of people and each week is coming up a bigger number and why that's important to you all is what we're doing with that marketing first of all we printed a bunch of new brochures if you sign up to be one of the beef providers in your part of the country you get 150 of those brochures as well as every ad that we've placed has a link on it that the people can click and get back to TLBA's website. Even if you don't have meat available right now, you certainly have Longhorns. So even though you're not already in the Beef Producers program uh, working on that, you are in long run, so that brings that contact back to your ranch, your phone number, your website, however you want to do it. So for $75, you're getting a lot of bang for the buck. So that's what the beef providers list is. When they get to the website, they uh, uh, go right to the page that lists your name by state. Anyway, that's just a little introduction to that. Uh, I've been doing the beef for, I don't want to tell how many years. <laughs> A long time, over 25. And the most common question I hear is, uh, how do you market it? That's why this crowd is here. So hopefully the people that are going to be speaking tonight will help you from the different directions that um, you can try this. Our first speaker is Christy Randolph. And she's been in it for a long time too. She didn't want to say so she is going to give you all a little insight on how she started out. How y'all doing? Good event, huh? All right. Joan and I have been raising Longhorn since 1992. Uh, became a passion very, very quickly uh, just because we thought they were beautiful, but realized that outside of selling at your consignment sales, et cetera, that there had to be a market for those that aren't going to bring a big dollar in a sale ring and help you support what you're trying to do. So the first step that we took was obviously to take them to our local locker plant, which is in Smithville, Texas. Uh, Smithville Food Lockers agreed that they would take our Longhorn cattle and they would process them however we wanted them to do that. And we were able to keep the head, the skull, etc. for sale at a different time. We didn't have our FDA label for a long time until, you know, we did some research and realized that if we wanted to do an outside sale to someone, that it needed to be, we needed to have our FDA number. And so the food locker was very beneficial in helping us walk through that process and get our FDA label. We actually started out selling to friends that just wanted to try it because they thought it was a novelty to, to have Longhorn beef. But once they tried the hamburger, tried the steaks, and tried the other cuts, realized the health benefits of it. It's good, lean, healthy, heart healthy meat. And we got into a, an area of time that everybody's looking to 
I don't want to jog a mile, but I'd like to have a decent steak that doesn't build fat up around my heart and clog my arteries. So outside of my family and my kids, they started networking outside the family for us with people they worked with. And we built up a clientele through our family. The, that maybe they're not there all the time, but they eat the beef and they love what it what it does, the way it tastes, etc. John is real good about going to local markets in our area, albeit very small. We can't supply an HEB or a Brookshire Brothers or whatever with beef. We simply don't have that kind of stock on hand. But he went to a local cafe and said, and she served hamburgers, and they're very generous sized hamburgers, and said, would you be willing to try Longhorn beef? And this is on the highway between, on Highway 71, which is Longhorn, Texas Longhorn, and I know y'all are from OU, I apologize. Texas Longhorn, he said, if you will try this beef, I will put a sign out on your highway that says, come in and try a hamburger off of Bevo. <laughs> we didn't do that because I like Bevo. But anyway, she agreed to try. So we took her 30 pounds of ground hamburger so that she could start serving it in her restaurant. And from that, she started buying sirloin to do her beef tips. And this was just a small hometown little restaurant. Her business doubled once she started serving Longhorn hamburgers. She couldn't keep it in stock. So then she was placing an order of about 30 pounds every week just of hamburger. And she said, I can't keep it in stock. And when I run out for the day, I'm out for the day. I cook what I think I'm going to need because, you know, she didn't want to have to throw food out. But basically, it was just word of mouth. You know, don't be afraid to go to your kids and say, hey, take a sample of this to some of your co-workers and see how they like it. But I recommend getting your FDA label because then you can maybe market to some of the... Uh, the smaller markets that are in your area that would be willing to try. I think our next endeavor is we've got a Mexican food restaurant place across the street and we've been asked to provide a sample of the beef there and, and you know, how convenient is that? I mean, they're in the same town, so you live, literally take it from the processor to the guy that's gonna cook it for you. Um, other than that, we've been very, very lucky uh, we can't keep the brochures. We would take them to that little restaurant and she put them out on every table and they were gone within three or four days and she'd call and say, bring me another stack. They're selling like hotcakes, literally. Uh, we're waiting now to see what kind of revenue we're going to get off of that, but that's basically how we started. So if you have questions for us, we'll be happy to help you. John's sitting right at the end of that table and he'll take any of your questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, does anybody have any questions they would like to direct, or shall we just leave our questions to the end of the seminar? Let's leave our questions to the end of the seminar. Uh, the next uh, young lady that's going to um, give her presentation, she hasn't been in the business very long, and she's already going big and strong. Rhonda? Me? Yeah, me. <laughs> okay. How do I work this thing? Hello. Oh, All right. Hi, I'm Rhonda Poe with 3P Longhorn Ranch. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to y'all. We're super small. Um, just started our beef business in 2015. And uh, the reason why we decided to do beef is similar to what um, you were saying, Christy was saying. <laughs> Uh, we had these amazing big bodied cows that were great producers, uh, real consistent production, but just didn't have a lot of horn. So their value was what they were worth on the, across the scale basically. I wasn't going to do that to those cows, they were good producers. So we decided we're going we're gonna to create beef out of them. And so it was, we knew it was a questionable market and how to market it is can be challenging so we decided to do farmers market 
And we chose a city, it's a big city, it's just outside of Dallas called Frisco, Texas. I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with it. But we chose that city mainly because of the audience that, or the consumer we were going for, which were more health conscious consumers. And we have just knew we had a little niche market of grass-fed longhorn beef. Ours was 100% grass-fed, no antibiotics, um, no added hormones or anything to our beef. And so those consumers out there at that farmer's market were really interested in our meat. We had a big beef producer right across the parking lot from us and he sold poultry, he sold pork, and he sold beef. But we would have them run over to our booth because we had our big banner up that said we were registered Texas Longhorns and it was a healthier red meat. Um, so they wanted information, of course, we had brochures, but the education process of educating those consumers was very time consuming. At farmer's market, they had a lot of questions. Um, we had to, you know, explain to them as far as the steaks are concerned with a grass-fed longhorn, it's gonna be a lean steak. And so if you're used to the fat and the marbling in your steaks, our steaks may not be for you. But our ground beef sold like crazy. We had customers come up to our booth and literally ask us why our beef was so cheap. So I'm like, well, I just, I based our prices based off of what I thought the beef market was going for. I went and went to many, many grocery stores and I studied all of the grass-fed beef. They weren't Longhorn, but there was buffalo and things like that. So I did a lot of price comparisons and that's how we priced our beef. But in that, in that city, they were used to paying ten dollars a pound for their ground beef so we were able to get a good premium for our beef there we did have you know we came up with all kinds of fun specials and every day was a market special every saturday we did one full year of market season there and it was exhausting it was very time consuming it was very expensive um, we did make money and we were profitable and we were able to you know that first year was pretty successful for our beef program, but the market that we were at in Frisco, the city of Frisco and the market required us to have a million dollar liability policy in place. That was expensive. We had to buy a utility trailer. We had to buy a, we had to buy a compressor because they didn't have electricity out there. So we had, an, our initial investment was thousands of dollars to get started just for that farmer's market. Our goal for that farmer's market was to get our consumer base and start to, for them to place bulk orders with us and be delivered to Frisco like once a week. That mar that business plan didn't work out. The consumers there, they have small refrigerators. They want one or two pounds of ground beef in their freezer, and they they want to come to the market every single Saturday and buy from you. So that whole business plan did not work out. I didn't have any ongoing customers except they wanted me at my booth every Saturday. So they would come, I got to know their kids' names, they would come up, and we sold our beef jerky and our beef sticks like crazy. That was what, we did that product, there's not a lot of profit margin in that. It costs a lot to make your beef jerky and all your smoked products, so you're not going to get a lot of profit out of that, but it will bring your customers in. They love it, it's really good, and then it, we would promote, you know, you buy five pounds of ground beef, you get a choice of one of our sausage products for free. So that kind of promoted our sausage products that we made. And we did do a lot of sausage products trying to take advantage of most of the beef and not just do all ground because the steaks are, you know, you either love them or you hate them. And our, but our fillets were one of the number one sellers uh, and we did a good, get a good premium for those fillets. So, uh, and that was, we had a lot of repeat customers on that. So we did that the first year and we started, you know, weighing all the time that we spent and it's not it's not a, a thing that you can just go hire a, an hourly wage person to sit at your booth and educate your consumers on grass-fed longhorn beef. So you don't want to set yourself up for a liability of any kind and you have to be very, very careful what claims you make because those claims can get you in trouble. So all of our USDA labels that we had made uh, were, they were all um, looked at by the, the uh, processing facility that we used and they had to be looked at and approved by their inspector. And we can't make any claims that would also put that processing facility in at risk as well. 
So if I, if I, and I tried to claim 100% registered Texas Longhorn beef, they would not let me put that on my label because they said it's very hard for you to, to prove that all of your cattle are 100% registered Texas Longhorns. I have registration certificates on every one of them, but if it came down to it, and I even put it on my table at my farmer's market booth, I had all of my licensing, and we do have a food manufacturer's license for the state of Texas. We did do that. We also have your food handler's license. Uh, we had to have the health inspector of the city of Frisco come by our booth and inspect all of our meat, our freezers, everything. So there, there's a lot involved when you're going to go and sell to the public like that. We had our own custom labels done. That was a, an adventure, a very expensive adventure. Um, so the, like Christy was saying, you know, there's, you can go at it really strong like that. And, and we did do well. And if we continue to do that, I think we could have expanded our beef program pretty quickly. But we had to take a step back. We kind of started rethinking our business plan. And we decided to start just selling locally. We did it some on Facebook, you know, social media, things like that. And so the business kind of slacked off a little bit. We weren't processing near as much. I was doing, like Christy said, I was going out to local restaurants and seeing if they want to try a ground beef. I talked to the chefs at some of the other, um, you know, bigger chains of restaurants. And um, they were real excited about, you know, doing the whole long, have a longhorn burger on their menu because they're in Texas, right? So they thought that would bring, that customers would get excited about that. Um, so we set, we just did local things and then um, using social media and things like that, we were able to sell quite a bit of our beef. I do a lot of the delivery and I have a utility trailer with a freezer in it and I take all my orders and I just go and deliver it in the once a week. Um, that works and it's, if it's local, I deliver for free. If it's outside the Dallas-Fort Worth area, I'd require a $100 minimum and I'd deliver for free. I'm not gonna deliver five pounds of ground beef all the, you know, 50 miles from my house. So um, that worked for us. Um, now we're actually going, we would have considered leasing some space and really trying to expand the beef business and do farm fresh eggs and all kinds of other things. But um, space was anywhere from a dollar to a dollar fifty a square foot. So we weren't sure that we could maintain that uh, on a on a monthly basis and we didn't want to fail at that. So we're just building on our, on our ranch, we're building a, um, a farm store. It's a small farm store. Um, we've got our LLC, it's Po Folks Farms and our beef company is called Po Folks Lean Beef. And so we're gonna have um, monthly tastings at our, at our farm store. We're gonna invite folks to come out. We're gonna cook for them. We're gonna let them try our beef and then hopefully sell our beef products to them. Um, we're going to keep making the beef jerky and all that because, like I said, it does it does bring people in. We have people calling me all the time for our beef jerky and our beef sticks. Um, but we're going to try that, and then one step further, uh, we're going to add to our products. We're going to uh, take advantage of the F1 cross program, and we're going to start crossing either a Charlet. Um, it's probably the number one on the list right now, Charlotte Bull on our Longhorn cows, and we're gonna offer that to our customers, hopefully starting next year, so that they can, if they want a little more marbling in their meat, we're gonna offer that as well as the 100% uh, Longhorn. But personally, I've just, I'm just a Longhorn meat fan. I like lean beef and the, and the health benefits of it. A lot of people, you know, the, the data that we have, though, I would have to say the data that comes from A&M back in 1987 or something like that, our, our cattle have changed a lot since then, and that data really needs to be updated. And I've checked into analyzing our own beef, and it's about $800 for you to take a sample of meat and analyze it for all of the health benefits in it. So it's a, it's a little pricey to do that, and you'd have to do that with every beef you processed. So it's not really profitable to do that. But I think as an association, it's something that we should look into doing, is doing another study, get A&M to get our Longhorn beef. And I don't know how many, how many steers they would take. Do y'all know how many steers that it would take to do a study like that? Yeah, we've already done that study. I'm sorry I didn't let you know about that, Ron. Oh, we already done it. Oh, well, that's good to know. Well, there you go. So that's it. So I'm done. We didn't do a full study. The full study takes three animals.
takes three Angus, three chicken, three pork. Well, we did a, uh, we did an updated study, but it was not the study that we had it done by Texas A&M. We went there first to see if we could do that same study, and they told us, well, that other study cost, uh, cost the association $80,000, but they'd do it for us way now for only $120,000. So the data we pulled out was the best we could do with the finance we had to do. The data is current. We took three steers from three different states, three different breeders, and we did the, uh, sent them to an, uh, a lab that analyzes meat. So our study is based on not, we didn't have the funds to do the kind of study Texas A&M did for us. That's all there is to it. So those are current statistics on our brochure based on the, the claims that are right there on the brochure. We didn't claim anything that, we, that would get us in trouble. So we do have new stats on that. Um, also, when she was talking about uh, her, what, what the state required, I'm glad she brought that up because a good point is each state is different. Oklahoma's rules are different from Texas rules, it's different from South Dakota rules, and so it's up to each uh, producer, the breeder, whatever, to go and find out what those requirements are. This has all been done for two or three states, but as we know, the government keeps changing things. So you need to call and check on current requirements for your state. You don't have to have a USDA certified uh, processor if you're not going to ship out of the state you're in. Across the line, you have to have USDA approved. So I, I wanted to mention that also. I'm done. Okay. I'm glad she brought up the farmer's market and she did talk about how much work it is, and it is. Uh, as a matter of fact, this little farmer's market out here had a booth selling longhorn meat right out in our own parking lot. And people say, I don't have the time, I don't want to do it, I, you know, it's just too much work. But they want to make money with these cattle. I said, well, what kind of work did you do to make a living? And how much effort did you put into that? To put a little effort into building your market is going to make you guys money. Wes is going to talk more on the num numbers part of it. But I've been told uh, several times here this, this weekend, I don't, have, I don't have anything I want to turn to beef. I don't have a market yet. Well, when I first, first started building a market, I didn't have a market either. But I got tired of taking $225 for our calves at weaning time or $250 at the sale barn for that cow you don't want in your program. So uh, there has to be a little effort put into that. A little bit of effort could be as little as uh, one gentleman told me he had a cow that kept chasing. He just took, him to the, took her to the sale barn. That's not a good solution on those kind of cows because everybody at that sale barn is going to see how that cow is acting and they're going to all say, man, those longhorns are crazy. And we all know they aren't. They can be made crazy. That cow needs to be ground. There's the beginning of your beef promotion. Have her processed. Put her in one pound patty packages, one pound hamburger packages. Give them to your friends. Give them to the feed store. Give them out. There's your samples. And that cow was, oh, would have only brought you 250 bucks at the sale barn anyway. So put a little put a little extra money by processing and start handing it out. Okay, I'm on the... Donate it to your church? Yes. Donate it to your church. We've done that in Oklahoma too. Donate it for 4-H uh, functions. Write it off. You can write it off and you can also build a consumer base. Your best market is within 200 miles of home. I'll tell you that for sure because of the shipping uh, things. Anyway, each breeder must check and see what their state requirements is are because Rhonda just gave for Texas. Um, so I want, I'm glad she brought that up. Okay, our next uh, speaker. Uh, I don't know her name, obviously, because I had it spelled wrong. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll let her introduce herself. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vicki Downing Boyd, and my name is not Becky Boyd. So if I say anything that you don't like or something that you don't agree with, we'll blame that on Becky. Because <laughs> I'm Vicki, and the bad one is Becky. <laughs> so... 
<laughs> but anyway, so um, my husband and I, um, Bill Boyd and I, um, we have B4 Kettle Company, and we're located in the northwest part of Oklahoma. Um, a little bit about our background, uh, we didn't get started in the Longhorn industry until 2016, so that's three whole years that we've been in it as going on our fourth year. So we are brand new, but we are, as you can tell, I am not a youngster. So I'm a retired nurse, a registered nurse, and I felt like I wanted to um, be able to cross over my nursing into the Longhorn. I grew up with cattle. I've been with cattle all my life, but now I get to go back to my roots. You'll get back to what I enjoy doing um, more so. And um, anyway, let me show you the next slide. So what I'm gonna talk about and what I was asked to do is give you a snapshot of our, um, our beef program and of our web store. So why, um, why would it be selling uh, Longhorn beef be a viable revenue for the Longhorn beef breeders? Why is it a viable revenue source for us? Well, according to the Nielsen data, the retail market in 2012 was $17 million. By the year 2016, that sales of grass-fed beef reached $272 million, and it doubled every year. There is not statistics right now to show how much more it has grown, but they are saying it's growing exponentially. So why do we have a web store? Um, we think and we feel and marketers all over the world think that pictures speak thousand words. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So 65% of the population are visual learners. What we say up here, it might take us six to 20 times us saying it over and over before you will retain it. So what we want to do is we want to show in a picture our product and why it is beneficial for our consumers. There is a rule called the, the rule of seven when it comes to marketing. You have to see this item seven times or hear about this item seven times before you have some kind of brand recognition. Also, why do we want a web store is because we want to be able to close the deal. We get them interested, we've educated them, we spend all this time, but how do we close the deal? So 80% of our consumers out there use credit cards. So if you don't have access to take a credit card, that's something you really ought to consider. So 80% of us are using credit cards. Only 20% have cash. So on our website, we have um, a, pay, a little uh, portion about us. And this little blurb here, that where we're located, and it's so important that you tell people where you're located. I don't know how many times that I'll be a consumer myself and I don't know where you're located. I don't know if you're in New York, California, or anywhere in between, and I don't know if that's something that I really want to consider purchasing if I don't know where you're located. Also, our beef is processed by the, um, at a local facility, and it is under state inspection. So you can take beef there um, and have it butchered, and you can sell it by the whole or the half, and you don't have to have it under inspection. That money had to have transacted prior to that beef being butchered. We opted to take our beef and have it butchered under inspection. So you pay a little bit more for that processing for the state of Oklahoma, but you can sell it anywhere within the state of Oklahoma. 
Um, we follow the whole food standards, and if you want to Google whole food standards, I mean, there is many, many, many pages about what those standards are. We try to the best of our ability to follow those standards. And one of the main standards is, is that animal has to be raised at least two-thirds of its life on the pasture. If we were living in Australia and we had 12 months of sunlight, we could feed our cattle grass 12 months of the year. But we, particularly us, we are in Oklahoma and we cannot feed we don't have grass 12 months of the year. So this allows for saying that you follow the whole food standards and then actually following those standards, you can um, say that you've raised your beef on the pasture at least two thirds of their life because you're gonna feed them hay in the winter, you cube them sometimes in the winter, depends on your program. Also with whole foods, um, there's animal welfare standards and with the the conscientious consumers that we have now, they really want to know that this animal is well taken care of and, um, and treated, digni treated with some dignity. Um, I personally don't want to send cattle across the scale. I don't want their horns cut off, them crammed into a, a semi-load and taken to a mass processor. I feel, you know, God intended, this is a personal opinion of mine, but I feel that the, the, the beef was, the cow was put on the earth for milk and beef production. And as long as we treat them humanely, um, one at a time, we treat them the best. I mean, my cattle all come up to me in the pasture. Um, I have one that just loves me, and no matter where I'm at, she comes to greet me. But when it's time, when, it's, when they're no longer um, worth what we can um, purchase or sell them for as um, producers, like the many of the others have said, we use our middle to lower grade um, longhorns for this process, or particularly for the bulls. So if we can take those bulls or whatever animal it is, and we can take them one or two at a time to the butcher, it's a more humane um, resolution of their life. They actually think they're going on a ride, you know? We've, they're used to be loading in the, in the trailers and being hauled around. So also on our website, um, we want to create and have a mission. So this um, we wanted to create a farm to family food source connection. We developed those personal relationships and we want to provide the healthiest, lean, locally pasture raised beef that we can. Also on our website, it's very, it's right up front. You don't want the consumer to have to look. We have all of our featured items. I actually, where we live, we, ha we focus on a 25 to 35 mile radius. We are not to the point that we can go 50 miles or farther. But I have a request for grass-fed soup bones. They're using them for bone marrow. Um, they believe if they boil the soup bones and get the marrow out, it's for municipal purposes. So a lot of, um, I have a request for the soup bones. I also have requests for oxtail. Um, there's a certain community that loves the oxtail. I also have a request for the beef tongue and for the liver. So all of these parts, you would think traditionally is just thrown away, but they're, at literally every aspect of this longhorn can be used. So you want these pictures to be something that entices them, something that um, gets their juices flowing and makes them interested. So you want that description of your package, not just to say you got four T-bones for this amount of money. You want it to be descriptive, so you want them to salivate, kind of like this dog is. And I've literally had people say, that steak made me so hungry. And they went on and purchased. You also want to use the feedback that you get. Um, 
With this particular program, we use Weebly and we use Square and they interact interchangeably and it, will, it gives them an opportunity to rate you, to, to give you their satisfaction. And you want to use this information, um, it's another marketing opportunity for you, as well as local recognition. Because we're in the Piedmont, Okarchi, Yukon, uh, northwest side of Oklahoma City, when people see these local people saying how good the meat is, it helps with the, with the marketing of it. Also on our website, we have an Instagram link. Um, yesterday you learned about Instagram um, with the hired hand and how important it is and how it's um, exponentially growing. And so this particular website has an Instagram link. So the last four posts that I did on Instagram now show up on my beef website. So this, this bull right here, He's a, sun, uh, a sand dollar bull. I got over 700 different page, 700 plus page um, views of him and four went to the website. It just shows you um, how pictures can help sell your product. And you always, always want to request emails. Not everyone wants to give you their email, but if they know that they can get coupons, they can get recipes, because I have a certain group that really want to know, well, how do I cook? And, well, how do I do this? So I, and with the consumers today are in such a hurry because they have so many activities. They've got baseball practice and football games and cheerleading and all the different activities that our kids have these days. How can they prepare this meat quickly and easily so um, I will be providing some Instapot you know the pressure cooker Instapot recipes utilizing the Longhorn um, product for my c customers so with this website with Weebly it also does an analysis of data so last week this was my snapshot. It showed that I had 22 visitors, but I had over a thousand page views. And I looked at this spike and tried to see, when you analyze the data, on September the 6th, um, what did I do on, on September the 6th that made a spike? So then I went and pulled my Facebook post. I also had posted it in um, the marketplace on Facebook for my local um, consumers and the local uh, buying groups. And this is the ad that I had posted that I have showed here on, on September the 6th. So that accounts for that spike. So what that tells me is, is I want to use something similar to this each time I talk about food. You want it to be something very scrumptious looking. And you want to do it consistently. So you don't want to do an ad today like this and then um, two months from now do another one. You want to do it consistent. So every two weeks or once a month you put in some kind of uh, consistent posting. As far as referring sites, this a slide shows you where the Facebook or where the 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 visitors came from. So this is showing you that the significant portion came from Facebook. The second um, highest ranked was the, the website we have with Hired Hand. And um, so you can look at this and you can see how you're doing. I also wanted to talk to you and tell you about partners that you need to consider in your communities. There is a small business development center in every major um, area that you live. This is a tax supported. We pay our tax money for this opportunity that if you're not aware and you don't use this resource, you're letting your tax money go. But this is a, a gentleman that works for the Oklahoma State University. He also works for the Small Business Administration, which is a federal program as well as a state program. And so he is per currently working with us on how to um, build our customer relations 
and how to develop an enterprise budget. So we will know when that calf hits the ground, how much money we actually have tied up in that calf. From the time that calf is born to the time that calf is ready to be butchered or sold, how much money we'll have tied up in that in that animal and then how much our processing and transportation costs are so we know exactly where we're at when we go to marketing we know if we can where we can put our price at if you have no idea what your costs are then you have no idea where you're going if you're going to make money or not make money also with this gentleman he is working in the Oklahoma City area putting together a list and he's going to have a speed dating with um, farm to table restaurants who specialize in farm to table. And so these restaurants, owners will be in a group or their chefs and then those producers that have farm to table products we will meet and do a speed dating. And you need about a three minute, he, we call it an elevator speech. The time it takes to go up the elevator, you need about a three minute spill, a pitch, if you, would you, if you would, a pitch of your business. What, who, what, when, where, and why. What about you is special? You know, what makes you um, better than, than Walmart beef? Or what makes you better than, than any, consumer or any um, person that sells the beef. So that's something we'll be participating in this winter. Also I'm working with a YouTube channel host that um, his main topic is on autoimmune disorders. Because of my nursing background there is a lot of individuals with autoimmune disorders. I have three children with, with uh, um, I just forgot that. Uh, John, you've got it. What? Remet? Aphid? <laughs> no, the arthritis. Oh. The, well, you do because you. I know. Now we know Arthritis. The digit. It's not the osteoarthritis, it's the rheumato rheumatoid arthritis. There I go, I'm sorry. Sorry, John. <laughs> but I know you go and get the infusions, so that's why I knew that. So anyway, I'm working with a YouTube channel host that is going to talk about longhorn beef and the benefits of longhorn beef and, and the grass-fed aspects of it in his YouTube channel. He's got 6,500 followers, 3,500 Instagram, and he's going on a platform in two months with 120,000 people. So we're working with him and he's going to help promote um, the industry as well as our own um, beef that we have for sale. So as far as production methods, what we do, we believe in bulls, bulls, and more bulls. So how many Longhorn people like to have a lot of bull calves? Anybody? I do. Why? They make beef. So don't cry when you have a bull calf. It's actually a money-making thing. So I, we actually put on Facebook, if you want to trade a bull, you know, we have some pretty decent bulls. If you want to trade, I'll take your trade in, but you won't get it back, obviously. But if you want to trade, um, we're willing to do that. We're also looking at adding um, into the F1 program the red Akashi they are particularly good on grass fed. They marble on grass. Wagyu's marble on feed. But this Akashi, they marble on grass. So we are looking into that and we have um, a producer that special, or that's what they raise and he's got some really good bulls. So we'll be letting you know in the next year or two how that program works out. Also, when you get into this, you need to know that grass-fed beef is 71% more expensive to produce. So therefore, you, if you list it, and I'm not trying to put 
anyone on the spot, but if you list it for $5 a pound, you're killing yourself because it costs you, I'm sure, more than, than that to produce. So really look at your market, look at your, uh, the different places. I went to Walmart just like Rhonda and priced the grass-fed products and make sure that you're pricing your product effectively. And then how can we be more effective and efficient since this product costs more to raise? Well, we're looking at improving the soil. There is a really good video, and I would like for y'all to write this down and watch it. On, you can Google it. It's called Soil Carbon Cowboys. It's a 10-minute video, and it describes regenerative grazing practices and how the regular beef producer has taken that practice and actually improved. They were in North Dakota, they were in Mississippi, North Dakota, I think they had 13 inches of rain a year. Um, Mississippi was 35 or 40 inches of rain a year and there was another place. And how they have regenerated the soil where it actually absorbs that rain instead of running off. It's very, very interesting stuff that they're working on. So there, here's my shameless plug. This is our bull, PCC Front Runner. Here is our website for our cattle and for our web store. So um, before I turn it over, I have one more thing. In the beginning, I talked about the rule in marketing. The first person that raises their hand and can tell me what the rule of that marketing is called, I have a cap for you, not anyone up here. <laughs> Jesse, how many? The rule of seven, you're correct. Let's give Jesse a round of applause. <laughs> What's well, not fair? And I've also included the credits for the different statistical information I gave you so you can cite my sources. Thank you very much. Okay, you've heard from three different types of programs, and we saved the best till last. <laughs> Wes. Wait, I was first. What does that make? <laughs> Go ahead, Wes. It's all so, yours. So, this should be fun. Let's see exactly how many minutes it takes me to piss somebody off. <laughs> Golly. So, um, I guess the she wanted me to talk about numbers some, because I think one of the biggest things in this business is knowing your numbers. But to give you, a, I guess, an upfront of what we've done, in 11 months, um, we supply 13 restaurants, about 1,027 pounds a week, and it averages about $5 a pound. So you can move this stuff easy, and you can make money at it really easy. When we first set out to do it, um, the only thing I knew is I wanted to build and grow bigger and better cattle than my neighbor. And uh, that's kind of how we got started. And then I realized it was really expensive to get started and so I needed to pay for my program and I didn't know what I didn't know and so I started talking to a bunch of breeders and I was given a piece of advice to let the bottom 10% of my herd feed the top 90% and so that's what we started doing um, and I was using all that money to feed my cattle raise my genetic program, buy better semen, buy better reset cows, all those things. Um, I didn't want to go out and peddle stuff door to door, so I wanted to get into restaurants because I thought even if I made a little less money on my product in the end, if I could find a consistent supply for it, I could keep a consistent revenue going. Um, and there's a, a ton that goes into it. We get asked a, a ton of questions about it as far as the licensing, the licensing, the legalities of it, what it costs us to raise it, how much money do we actually make on it, where do all my cattle come from. Um, 
you know, what am I paying for them? All those things. And it would be, we'd be here all day if we sat down and went through the whole program. So I guess when we get to asking questions, you know, I'll try to answer them as they come up in front of everybody to try to, to try to help out. How we kind of arrayed, uh, how we kind of got to our price point is at $5 a pound to a restaurant, if I got to go out and buy the calf, take it home, process it, have it delivered, I make about a dollar a pound. If the calf is born on my place, I make about $2.50 a pound. Cost me a dollar to birth it, a dollar to raise it, a dollar to process it, 50 cents to transport it. That's the simple math. I'd rather have them born on my place than have to go and buy them because it's extra money. But when you process more a year, then you can physically have born out of the amount of cash you buy, you buy a lot. And then I started talking to larger breeders that breed three and 400 cows a year and they in tune have 100 and 150 bull calves a year they were getting 150 to 170 dollars a head at weaning time at the cell barn so it was a godsend for me to pull up at 300 dollars a head open the trailer door and let them fill it up because then they didn't have to feed them and the truth of the matter is now when i walk out in my pasture i have some cattle that won't even stand anywhere around some of yours but i've got some 60 inch cows i wouldn't sell you for thirty five hundred dollars because that's what they're worth in beef and if you want to raise the value of your cattle find it at, find a source for your beef i think if we found if we all worked towards that we could raise the floor of the bottom value of some of our cattle because we sell cows here in these cell rings for $1,800. If you have an outlet, you can buy an $1,800 cow in a cell ring, process it, and still make money on it. So there's no reason we should be selling our cattle for that cheap. Um, but that was the reason we got into it. And we work with a lot of smaller breeders. Like I've had a couple conversations with people here today that we work with that are trying to get outlets uh to move some of their animals a lot of people sell to buddies they sell to small local restaurants which is kind of what got us turned on about it was john making smart act comments <laughs> out, of, out of his house one day so i'll go ahead and tell you i'll tell you what he did so i went and i bought a black heifer a black kettle heifer uh, from John and we were out riding around because you know John's gonna try to sell me everything he owns while I'm there and he had some poor little heifer in this back corner of this pasture that had great genetics so I guess when she was born maybe she bit John because she, she had a broken horn and you know I know a lot of people believe that uh, that genetic trait for somehow gets passed off but I promise you it doesn't she had great genetics and I'm trying to blow him down on the price to get this calf and he looked at me and said, I'd never sell you, sell her to that for you because she's worth twice that in meat of beef. And that's what really got me thinking and that's what got me started in it. And that's how we started uh, feeding our cattle and, and starting our program. Um, so a lot of people get on us because we, we don't, I'm not out trying to push $16 ribeyes because we have a lot of different markets that we deal in. I sell a lot of stuff in Houston to a lot of people that, how do I say this politely, they wouldn't give their kid a decent education, but they'll walk into a restaurant in front of everybody else and beat a table demanding to know what's in their kid's hamburger because they really love them so much. And so I sell a lot of beef off of the um, qualities of it, the health benefits of it. I sell a lot of it to people in San Antonio as a gimmick because it's a Texas Longhorn. What else do you want in Texas? Texas Longhorn Burger. Um, we've even got restaurants in Houston. I just showed them a picture of one that's got one for $16 a piece. They call it the Southern Longhorn Burger. Um, there's and a lot of people buy it because of the ease of cooking with it. I don't know if you've ever made chili or anything out of Longhorn beef, but you don't have to cook it and drain it and everything else. We build profit into our beef with restaurants because there's no shrinkage in it when it's cooked 
um, because we have to compete in there. A lot of people don't get into the restaurants because you're competing with companies like Cisco that's selling ground beef to a restaurant at $3.28 a pound. It's hard to compete with that. Um, especially when I'm in the door at three sixty a pound and that's what it cost me to get there. You know, if I go three twenty eight, I'm doing it for charity at this point and it just can't be done. So one of the ways we close some of those restaurants is they advertise a one third pound burger on their menu. A pound of my beef I can get three one third pound burgers into it. They get two one third pound burgers out of their pound of Angus beef. Therefore, it builds more profit into my burger. It got me into the restaurant. So if any of you guys are ever having issues getting in somewhere or figuring out a market in your area, or maybe you're a small producer um, or a small breeder and you're looking for an outlet with your beef. I had a conversation with a guy today. He's gonna butcher some and start selling to his buddies. Well, one of the things I'll, I'll warn you about you give some away for free, they're gonna come back to buy. You better have some ready when they come back to buy. Uh, because we've given away to everybody that's now customers. I can't off the top of my head name one person I know that I've given some to that doesn't come back and buy. So if you can get one small contract or a handshake agreement or whatever locally where you are to sell your beef, Hook up with one of these other distributors that move a lot of animals and work out a deal. One of the deals I worked out with a guy earlier today was if you'll get one small outlet to sell your beef, it gives you a way to move your excess cattle, unload your cold cattle, and then if you end up with more than you can move, I'll buy them. If your supply runs out and you need more animals, I'll send them to you. It'll keep his supply line open, provide money to feed his cattle and move his program along and it gives me a place to turn and go to to purchase animals if I need to. So if you're a small breeder or producer and you want to get into it or something like in that realm, uh, let me know. I can put you together with somebody that you can work with or you can team up with or even answer any questions that you may have. Yeah. Wes brought up some very good points, and I, so did everybody else here, different avenues to market. The biggest point I want to bring up is we got to stop taking these low prices for our cattle. It, it, when any of you do it, we all hurt from it. So there is a way to make money off these bottom-end cattle. Okay, open for questions. Anybody got a question? Back to the grass bed. Back to the grass fed. On, on my place, I call it grass feeding. However, I use, you know, they're in the pasture on Bermuda. I use weed killer, I use fertilizer. I use range cubes to 20% to range cubes and I also put hay which the hay comes out of a pasture which also had uh, weed killer and fertilizer on it. Is that still grass fed? You may answer it. I may piss you off a little bit when I answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Alright so I've done I've been down this whole grass fed all natural it's all black free range healthy water massaged in the whatever yeah this, this let's let's all right let's get the bander out so we all know what hay comes from it's grass goes in the fancy machine comes out a big round bell that's grass fed you don't have to live where grass grows year round to be grass fed hay's grass fed from a legality standpoint are you pouring roundup down the car down the cow's throat don't worry about it um, here's the only one that I found that has become an issue for me is and I took this to two of the doctors at Texas A&M and I questioned them about it we were buying at the end of every show season I get a bum rush because we we are grass-fed that's how we promote our beef um, I get an influx of show steers you know those ones that have been on God knows what to make them weigh 
like a small elephant. Um, I was told to buy a guy with a doctor at Texas A&M to turn them out for 45 days on grass, and I'm good. So for my conscience, I turn them out 90 days on grass, and I call them grass-fed. Cubes, where the whole cube, con the cube conversation comes in is an all-natural cube versus a medicated cube versus a urea-added cube. We use an all-natural cube. My conscience is clear about it. The legality of it, I've asked and I've been told I'm good giving any kind of cube. But we also advertise that we don't do like the real grow pellets in the ears, you know, the hormone injections. We don't do any of that. I don't advertise an antibiotic free because if a cow's got a cough, it's going to get antibiotics. Um, no, I mean, but a lot of people, a lot of, I process it. No, if they're sick, I don't process it. Right, and also all my carcasses are in state inspected. So the inspection facility I use has a inspector that pulls blood and temperature on all the cattle before they're put down. And then the carcasses are graded, so it has to pass all that before it's even cut up. And anymore, if they cannot wash off a trailer and into a plant, they won't do it. They want to load them. They want to make sure that it's healthy before it's unloaded and put into their processing Does that answer your question? I'd like to answer your question just a little bit as far as grass-fed. We don't claim we're organic. And what you're talking about as far as the chemicals on the pastures and all that, that you, that's when you become certified organic. We don't claim that. We claim strictly grass-fed, and ours are all, we go by the American Grass-Fed Association guidelines for, for plant products, and we do feed ours. We feed them, um, sometimes they're compressed pellets, but they're all plant-based. So we do finish them on that. We feed them alfalfa, which has a lot of protein in it. It has a lot of weight gain benefits. So we do finish them. If they're if, if it's in you know summer, spring, summertime, they're grass, 100% grass finished. If we're processing in the winter and we're finishing a steer, we're gonna we're gonna supplement them with American Grass Fed Association guideline plant based products, and that's how we get it by get by with it on from the legality standpoints. But I we do not claim uh, certified organic whatsoever. Right, organic is the key. You don't want to go there. Yeah. All natural, that'll work. <laughs> but organic is government. That's all. All we need to say about that is a book this thick on what it takes to be organic. And there is one. There's there's no guidelines by the USDA that is that has been published of of, of the criteria for grass fed beef. There's there's so it's kind of a gray area. There's nothing that's definitive about it. Okay, any more questions? And if you have certain people you want the question to go to, so speak so. Louder. Where does liquid feed fit in? Depends on what's in the liquid feed. Yeah, I mean... So I use liquid feed, and if you're going to use liquid feed and you're going to be a natural deal the what I suggest doing is asking the provider where the protein comes from and you'll get your answer on what's in it yes so when you ask I don't even know I'm talking to when you ask what about the liquid feed what about it it works I like it. Who is that? No, no, no. Mine is a supplement. It's a protein. I use it as a protein supplement, but they have the. I buy it from Anapro, the one that I use, because they did a huge study on it. And they have two different versions of it. One is all natural, and one gets its. Uh, uh, the protein con content from a word I can't pronounce. So, 
I don't mess with that one. But the, the one version that I use is all natural. No. No. Because when I went, so I know she didn't want to go down this road. But when you go down the road of all natural, if it will grow in the yard, I'll feed it. If it was manufactured, I won't feed it. And if you'll, if you'll go off of that, you'll stay pretty true to what you can consciously do and not get hammered from a legality standpoint. Um, there's that one and the 100% Texas Longhorn. I had a meeting with our state people and I questioned the doing it as 100% Texas Longhorn. I was told that as long as I got papers on mama and daddy, uh, and the TOBAA will back it, then I'm good. Any other questions? It depends on your product, what you want to... The question was, age, what age do you do this with slaughter? What age do you do what? I assume that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you're just doing 100% ground beef, yeah. you know, then you can slaughter, you know, a six, seven year old steer. But if you're going to get steaks and things like that uh, for your consumables, um, I, like, I like to do them at least, you know, no, no later than 18 months is my range. In the state of Oklahoma, it's 30 months or less you can make into steaks or, you know, the specialty cuts over that. Um, but we butcher ours at 20 months of age. There are also old cows who have stopped making babies. You grind them and it's wonderful ground beef because you're using every cut on that female, on that carcass. So. I'll push a steer. I'll push a steer another couple months. I want a bull. Darlene, we grind them all the time. Old you bulls? don't try to make steak. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. no. Ground beef. That's ground I'll make steak. Yeah. We're talking on your cuts. 18 to 20 months, that's all there is. You need to you know, pay attention to the age. If you're doing cuts, if you're just doing ground beef, in other words, we'll haul a bull to the sale, a slaughter a processor, and tell him to grind the whole thing. And once it's ground, it'll, you'll see how lean it is. We've never had a problem with the, with the meat being anything but great. We took a four-year-old bull that would not stay in the pasture, kept jumping the fence, and we had him ground except for the tenderloin and that was the best tenderloin you could have eaten so you just have to see it it depends on the quality of the forage they eat whether how tender they are it's not necessarily that they have all the testosterone in their system we had a question over here we can't hear you can you speak up By the way, thanks for so many people showing up. It shows we have a need and an interest. I appreciate you all. So this is my question. We're very new at the Longhorn, and we have several registered, and then we have some that are branded, but we can't figure out who their bloodline is. Can you market them as Texas Longhorn or no, if they're not registered for beef? Say that again. So Can you I market them as what? Longhorns. It's a Longhorn. It is Longhorn. And yep. it's branded, but we just can't figure out the right. line because, you know, we bought them from... I just wouldn't put the three numbers in front of it. All right. Don't call it 100% Texas Longhorn. Oh, so we can do Texas Longhorn. Okay, well, thank registered. you. Or registered Texas Longhorn. Yeah, don't call it a registered Longhorn either because it's not. Right. <clears throat> That's why our inspector wouldn't let us claim anything even though ours are all 100% registered we have certificates on everybody in our beef herd 
Um, and we took advantage of the TLBAA special and registered all of our older cattle uh, so that we could put them in our beef herd and, and make our claims true that they all are 100% registered. But we don't advertise, we can advertise it, we just can't put it on our label that goes to the consumer. One other thing about that, if the sire and the dam are registered, we have a, uh, the beef, have a place to register an animal for slaughter, and I think we came up with three bucks. You don't get a certificate, but it's on your records, under horns, that this is a registered Texas longhorn, because it's been registered for slaughter. And again, if you've already got papers on the animal, because you thought you were gonna keep it as a producer, that paper is all you need. But if you don't have them registered like we're talking, you can get a slaughter certificate for three bucks. Any other, any other questions? We have several opinions. <laughs> <laughs> We've got plenty of opinions. It could be the genetic lines I've been buying calves out of or what have you. We were actually discussing this earlier today. When they get to fighting, I get to abandon it. I'll leave balls on them. That, can I say balls? I'll leave balls on them. I'll leave balls on them because they seem to grow a little faster in the beginning. But I don't want the issues. You know, so once they get to acting up, I get the bander out. Also, once they get to being that 16 or 18 month age, uh, they get to doing more. They're a housing out. problem. Let's just put it that way. They're a housing problem. I didn't found one. We do the same thing. As long as they're not causing problems, we leave them intact. And they can be 18, 20 months old and still be intact when they go to butcher. Just depends on their temperament. And we've done that too. And I have to say, my personal opinion is I could tell the difference between a processed bull and a processed steer at the same age. But we would we we would band our steer or at weaning age, uh, and then some we would band it 12 months. We've kind of done a little bit of experimentation and to figure out what works if there's any difference in the flavor at all. Um, and I have to say, my personal opinion is, is that I could tell the difference between a bull that was processed at 18 months and a steer that was processed at 18 months. It's, it's just a little bit, um, I believe the, the steer was a little bit more tender than the bull was, but not by much. Any other questions? I want to reemphasize to you all, if you join the beef producers list, that $75 is going to be put to work, not only for your brochures, 150 of them, but the rest of it is going to be put to work to add, offset our budget so we can advertise more. If we educate the people out there, then we will not be selling these cows at the sale barn for $250. I saw a hand over here. Becky. Tina. Tina. I don't know. <laughs> we didn't sign any releases. <laughs> I don't know whether it's been recorded or not. Oh, yes, it's been recorded. Yeah, yeah. where will it be? Yeah, Trey set the camera up and recorded it all. Any other questions? I'm sorry? That's another good opinionated question. <laughs> State of Oklahoma will not allow you to hang more than 13 days. Because Texas is better than Oklahoma, we hang 14 days. <laughs> What did I tell you? R21. It's like another one of those questions. Of, we got plenty of opinions. Uh, I, I haven't found a difference. I've gotten in a rush sometimes and I've hung for two or three days. And I don't. 
Oh. Enzymes quit working after 11 days. Yeah, then I couldn't feel my feet. And yeah, so, but John was, I had this conversation with John too. John says after about 10 or 11 days. Enzymes quit working. It, it, the enzymes aren't doing anything anymore. So I don't personally find a difference, right? This, the but you inspector, don't want to process them early. The state inspectors in Oklahoma won't allow them to hang longer than 14 days. They can't be called inspected beef if you hang them. They just won't allow it. This brings us back to what I mentioned previously. You all need to check your state's requirements. Because don't leave here from coming here from South Dakota and think you got to do everything the way our state said. Go call your own state. Yeah, a local processor is a very good source. And your uh, state people also have a good answer for you on processing plants, because they know where they go to inspect the meat. Any more questions? I just received an update from uh, our advertising and the number of clicks that have hit, and we've been exposed to over 7,000 people. We are paying $50 a month for that, and it's working. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm glad we didn't have to go to the little room. KLBA is great setting us up in here.